Welcome to the highlights of the fifth game of the FIDE World Chess Championship match between Ding Liren from China and Jan Nepomnishchi from Russia. At this point, the match is evenly poised with both players having two points each. The winner of this game will take the lead in the match, which is a 14 game match. So, this game is very important. White is Nepomniaschi, black is Tingli Ren. White started with his favorite move e4, and after e5, we have the Rui Lopez opening, which we had in the first game of this match. Black played a6, white played bishop a4, black knight f6, white castled, bishop e7, and now we have the first deviation from the first game. As you would recall, that in the first game, white had played, uh, well, white had taken on c6. Uh, and it was a surprising move because it is a rarely played move. In this game, white played d3. Well, the move d3 protects the e pawn, and now white threatens to capture black's e pawn after removing the defender. Uh, bishop c6 followed by knight takes e5. That is white's threat. Black responds by playing b5. White retreated bishop b3. And now black played d6. Well, white played c3. And this is the move which uh, typically symbolizes the Rui Lopez opening. He does not develop his knight usually he refrains from developing his knight from c3 instead he places his pawn on c3 the c3 pawn helps white to occupy the center later with d4 and it also restricts black's knight from jumping to b4 or d4 squares so this is what uh, typically uh, symbolizes the Ray Lopez opening uh, White would later bring out his knight slowly via d2 square, f1 square, and finally head for squares uh, either d5 or f5 with knight e3 or knight g3. So White would very slowly maneuver and gain a good position, but it's a long term plan for White, and black and white both sides have plenty of options uh, on the, along the way. So this is one of the most attractive features of Rui Lopez opening. Both sides have plenty of choices. Here black castled, white played h3. This is a restrictive move. Uh, it doesn't allow the bishop to come to g4 and pin the knight because this knight is useful for white, especially if white is aiming for d4. The f3 knight would be quite useful in attacking e5 and defending d4. So he plays h3, which is a restrictive move. Black goes bishop to b7. White played a4, basically trying to activate the rook on a1. Black played knight a5. Well, I would like to uh, stress that both sides have plenty of options. They are simply choosing one of the options. It doesn't mean that these moves are the only moves are, or are the best moves. Uh, white played bishop a2 and now black played c5. So this is a move which, well, it takes a lot of space on the queen side and it opens diagonal for the, the queen. It takes b4, d4. All these squares on the queen side are controlled by black pawns. So black has space on the queen side. The flip side of this move is the d5 square is no more defended by any of the pawns. Till the previous move, the pawn potentially could defend d5. Right after advancing the pawn to c5, black's control over d5 is lost. Now here white played bishop g5. Well, trying to exploit the weak d5 square. Surprisingly, this position had been played previously. Last year, 
uh, the Iranian chess prodigy Ali Reza Firuza had uh, obtained exactly this position where he played knight to a3. So technically bishop g5 is the first move uh, which had never been played by any player in the past. It's a novelty but it's a very normal move. Black played h6 chasing the bishop and white exchanged the bishop for a knight. This is not the first time in this match where we have seen Jan Nepomniachtchi exchanging his bishop for opponent's knight. Uh, here white will try to prove that the knight, the extra knight which he has is more useful than the dark squared bishop of the opponent. And uh, well black will try to prove vice versa. He will try to prove that bishop is better than the knight. So it's a very interesting imbalance. And to understand this position better, let's move on to, to this position and see what exactly white is trying to achieve and the position which black typically has to avoid. We have removed all the pieces from the board and we have kept the same pawn structure with the exception white has a knight on d5 which cannot be driven from this point. There is not a single black piece which can push back the knight or offer exchange with the knight. And black has a bishop which is restricted by his own pawns. So look at these three pawns. They are of the same color of the bishop. So both bishops and pawns are performing the same job of controlling dark squares. The light square uh, on d5 is left unprotected. Now how is this position? White is almost winning in this position because the knight is very powerful, the bishop is bad, but it's not sufficient to have a good knight against bishop. White should typically try to provoke a second weakness and attack the second weakness. So here the best move for white may be to play something like knight c7 attacking the b-pawn and when black moves his b-pawn, white can basically capture either b or d-pawn with his king and knight. He can pressurize these pawns and finally he can win one of the pawns. So the lesson from this position is that in order to win, one must have uh, not only one but two weaknesses uh, to attack. So this is important from this uh, the main game's perspective because as we shall see that white later created a second weakness and managed to uh, break through. Okay back to the game the position after 14th move in the game between Jan Nepomniachtchi white and Ding Liren black. Well we had this position white took AB black took AB and now white developed his knight black played knight c6 well in the previous game we had seen that Ian had a knight on the edge of the board and finally he had an inferior position so ding this time he centralizes he brings back his knight quickly having said that in this position i feel the move d5 might have been a better move. It eliminates uh, the weakness of d6 pawn and basically black tries to storm white center by playing a move like c4 or d4. So this would have been a very nice idea by black. Uh, however, after moves like ed and exchange of this bishops on d5, white might still try to prove that his knight is better than black's bishop on f6. But the game would be very close to equality. Instead, black played knight c6, white went bishop 
t5 and after the exchange of this rooks black played queen d1 white went rook e1 this move basically vacates the f1 square uh, for the knight the knight from here would later be deployed on g3 or e3 depending on the position well black played rook a8 attacking the queen and the queen went to a very nice square that is d1 from here the queen would basically aim on the king side or go to b3 depending on the situation so d1 is a nice square for the queen and now we have a very instructive move by black uh, although there were players who didn't like the move bishop d8 but this move does have a plan of activating the bishop on this diagonal so one of the ways how we can activate our bishops is by putting it on a good diagonal and advancing the pawns to clear the way for the bishop so black's idea is to put the bishop on b6 and then advance c4 clearing the diagonal for the bishop here well white played knight f1 black went knight e7 challenging this powerful b7 uh, d5 bishop white exchanged and put his knight on e3 now we have a typical scenario where the knight finally targets the dream square which is temporarily defended by the black knight but white is inching towards his main objective which we had seen now black played bishop b6 all according to plan and here white played a very instructive move which i had discussed earlier that a weakness one weakness is not always sufficient to win in chess so we have to create an additional weakness and then attack on two fronts white played a very surprising move and a very instructive move that is h4 so having secured this square for the knight white would typically like to advance on the king side and put this knight on this square that way he would like to remove the e7 knight uh, to exchange the knight and then finally post his knight on d5 that is his first idea and the second idea of course is to try to create a second target of attack on the king side so this is white's idea he pushes the pawn to f h4 and what is uh, quite interesting to note is that till this point Jan was playing very quickly so he had almost uh, the whole opening prepared till middle game or till late into the middle game and he was feeling very confident in this position black played queen c6 white played h5 this is the first point where white uh, thought for a while he paused for a while and later in the press conference he said that he was considering the alternative c4 with the idea of blocking black's c pawn so that the bishop on b7 6 would remain stuck behind his pawns but finally ultimately he decided for the move h5 because after c4 he came to the conclusion that black will have good counterplay after bishop a5 so he opted for the move h5 and in the game black played c4 white played d4 and after ed it's another very interesting moment white decided to take with the knight now many amateurs here would prefer to take with the pawn 
and have a good center. Uh, white has a perfect center controlling all these squares but in this particular position black has defense. Black would play bishop a5, rook e2 and a very instructive move that is d5. So we see that this bishop few moves back was stuck behind pawns uh, which were on the dark square on the same square of the bishop but now after d5 we see the pawns have basically changed the squares the pawns are on light square this is a dark square bishop so it's not a bad bishop anymore the bishop has become a good bishop uh, it is doing complementary role it's performing complementary role uh, than the, with the pawns and now black is ready to advance his queen side pawn majority it's a good position for black so this is what probably black had anticipated but white played knight d4 now he is offering the, to exchange his knight for the bishop and if black takes this white would recapture with his queen and although the imbalance has changed we no more have a knight against bishop scenario but in this position white has a safe advantage because this d6 pawn is backward it does not have any pawn support and white has a very important d file to attack this pawn so white would have a slightly advantageous position and that is why uh, black refrained from capturing on d4 he played the move queen c5 instead white played queen to g4 well it looks quite good that the queen is aggressively placed in front of black's king and it can also move towards the queen side but later it was found that white had a better move that is queen f3 the idea behind this move is to of course threaten uh, a discovered attack on the black rook and only after black rook moves to a slightly inferior square then go for the move queen g4 so the idea of playing queen g3 is correct but maybe white should have improved his position first and then gone queen to g4 another reason why queen f3 is slightly superior is that against queen g4 black played queen e5 but here if he goes queen e5 then white can remove the queen from e5 square with knight g4 and then execute the move e5 at attacking the rook with his queen so this is one of the reasons why playing queen f3 might have been slightly better than queen g4 white played queen g4 anyway and black played queen e5 which is a good move white played knight f3 removing the queen from the strong e5 square black went queen e6 offering to exchange the queens white went knight f5 threatening a checkmate on g7 black decided to exchange the knights and after the game in the press conference ding liren said that this is where he made a mistake and he should have played queen f6 defending the g7 pawn and not letting white pawn come to f5 which uh, which he did after knight f5 okay after the exchange of knights the pawn went to f5 and we have a scenario where white has typically a knight against a bishop all the opponent's pieces are coming off the board gradually and we have a typical scenario with knight against bishop and both sides having queens and rooks black played 
queen f6 white queen e4 attacking the a8 rook black went rook b8 because he needed to guard the b7 square as well so he played rook b8 white played a very instructive move here so this is a very important moment of the game not because white played a winning move but because the small moves like the move which is played now are the moves which are frequently missed by amateur chess players white played rook to e2 what is the purpose behind this move well white calmly defends this pawn before proceeding further the main purpose is black was actually threatening or planning to play b4 and then the queen would attack the b2 pawn so this was black's counter attacking plan a good player or a or one of the leading players of the world should not only know what to do but also should know what his opponent is trying to do he played rookie to preventing black's idea black played bishop c5 now although the bishop is on a good diagonal but it has it is totally away from black's defense on the king side it is stuck somewhat by the pawn on d6 so this is one reason why white feels he has the advantage and now look at the way how white executes his uh, advantage he converts his advantage to a winning position he plays g4 now he goes for attack on the king side he has an extra pawn on the king side so he starts advancing the pawn and since the bishop on c5 is unable to defend the king side white senses his chance and as i had mentioned that it is not only sufficient to have one weakness we should have a second target of attack and the second tar first weakness is of course the d5 square which is a strong point for white the second weakness is the possibility of attack on the king side black played queen d8 white went queen d5 well black played king f8 now black is somewhat is trying to defend is moving his king away from uh, the pin of this pawn he doesn't have many active ideas anyway and now white played another preparatory move he played king to f1 and commenting on this game one of the strong players like uh, who was commenting anish giri he said that these are the small moves which actually ensure victory and quite often missed by uh, the weaker players uh, another move with similar aims would have been king to g2 basically moving away from a potential pin now how does the f pawn affect the scenario well there's another reason behind playing such moves that is uh, well uh, it had white played king g2 it might have been even better because that would move his king away from a potential back rank check white knows what he has to do and that is why before going for the final attack he improves his king position and then launches his final assault on black black played rook c8 white played another very instructive move that is rook to e4 now he brings up his rook and prepares a devastating pawn break black played rook b8 once again black is basically tied down he's simply waiting and white executed his break he played g5 it's a brilliant move and perhaps the most decisive move in the whole game 
the idea is to break open black's king side black already doesn't have control over the d5 square which is occupied by the queen so he uses the second weakness to break through now the purpose the tactical justification behind this move is if black takes hg5 which he did white would play rook g4 with the aim of putting his knight on g5 and attacking these squares if black plays the most natural move that is f6 to defend the pawn white is a pawn down but he has a brilliant resource knight h4 the idea is the knight would land on g6 and deliver a decisive check against the king note that these squares are controlled by the queen the point behind knight h4 is that if black captures g h4 white would play h6 white is a piece down he is a pawn down but he finally achieves the decisive breakthrough he would play hg7 or h7 and the pawn would promote and the king would be subjected to a mating attack now if g h6 white has a couple of way to checkmate either he can play queen g8 check and rook g7 met or he can play in this position rook g8 check first and queen e6 checkmate so this was white's brilliant idea when he played rook g4 g5 and rook g4 he sacrificed a pawn with the intention of sacrificing another piece and checkmating black black played rook a8 perhaps this is the best defense he wants to play rook a1 check and he wants to move his queen to a8 somehow trying to get rid of the queen on d5 black white captured the g5 pawn black played this move here white has to play king to e2 the point behind black's defense was that had he played king g2 black would have played queen a8 exchanging the queens and somewhat resisting although even here white would have won but this was black's main idea so white avoided that idea and played king e2 where i mean from queen a8 black would have aimed to to exchange the queens but now the queen on g5 will not be pinned so he played king e2 black played queen e7 check white covered the check with his knight now you see it's a typical fight between a good knight and a bad bishop both the squares d5 and e4 cannot be controlled by this bishop although it is on a good diagonal it does nothing to defend on the king side so in this game white had su succeeded in demonstrating how to uh, have a better knight than a bad bishop black played queen e8 once again trying to to move to maybe a8 and challenge white's strong queen white played king f3 basically removing unpinning the knight now black played queen a8 and here white could have played middle game with queen d2 and he could have continued to attack on the king side with queen g5 but he opted for a safer way to win he simply exchanged the queens by taking on a8 and after rook a8 he played f6 the idea behind this move is if black takes gf6 white would capture with the knight and there is no way how this pawn can be stopped from promoting if black plays king e7 with the idea that the rook would physically stop the pawn white could then play knight g8 check 
preventing the rook from coming to h8 and then advancing the pawn towards promotion. Note that this bishop can do nothing to stall white's advance on the king side. So this is a typical example where the bishop is not good and the knight is better than the bishop. So after f6, black played g6. This position is already not good for black. So he tries to somehow resist. But after this, white wins a pawn. Black counterattacks to take back the pawn on b2. White advances his king. Black takes on b2. White plays rook to h6 with the intention of advancing his king to e6 or g6 and then checkmating black king. Note that the knight on e4 and the pawn on f6 play a crucial role in this final position. In this position, unable to defend against white's idea, if black takes bishop f2, white will simply play check and advance his king and finally he would play knight g5 or knight d6 checkmating the black king on f7 therefore after rook h6 black decided to give up black resigned Jan wins once again the russian grandmaster and world number two Jan nepomniashti takes lead in the world championship match so already in five games we have three results only two draws this is turning out to be one of the most exciting world chess championship matches in recent history